Okay, everyone, so this is the second talk of our uh, Gonda seminar series. Okay, and I am very happy to have a colleague and a, also a friend of mine, Adam Zido, okay, who works next to me on the second floor, our very own. And he's going to talk to us about multisensory integration for self motion perception. Since uh, I'm sure almost everyone knows Adam very well here, I will not give much of an introduction, but there's one thing I did want to say. And that is, while I've, I've known Adam for several years now since joining the center, uh, but over the past year, we've started actually collaborating on a project. And it's really, really fun to work with him. So if you're a student, I suggest going to his lab. And if you're a PI, then I start, suggest starting collaboration. It's a lot of fun. Okay, Adam, the stage is yours. And we have about 40 minutes for the talk, and then we can do some questions and try to end on time. All right. Thanks, Ruth, for the introduction. Um, can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to be talking about multi stage integration for self-motion perception. Um, so first I will start out, you can see my screen as well, right? Yeah. All good? Okay. So I'll give a brief introduction and I'll present uh, some work that we've uh, um, generated here in the lab on humans and on rats. And the human work um, spans a few different domains. Uh, we'll talk about self-motion perception in Parkinson's disease. Um, we've also got um, cross-sensory adaptation studies in, uh, in uh, normal, healthy uh, uh, individuals, as well as uh, some work on autism. And then I will give some uh, uh, rat results where we've discovered a, a novel cure, an interesting cure of self-motion perception in rats. Okay, so uh, just by way of introduction, general introduction, um, we, we are walking around the world constantly. We're, we're always all over the world. And we need to know where we are. It's a, one of the most basic needs in order to interact in the, in the environment is to know where you are. We use many sensors to do this. That's why it's multi-sensory. Um, visual sense, uh, senses optic flow. As you move in one direction, the world moves, seems to move on your retina in the opposite direction. That gives you a cue as to where you're moving in space. Um, for those who don't know, for example, uh, Aristotle didn't know, he didn't count it as one of the five senses, but we've got a sense of balance inside our inner ear, the vestibular sense, um, one of my favorite, because it's uh, very interesting and uh, um, not described and yet is very important for our everyday function. And if it goes wrong, we know, and, and whoever suffered from vertigo knows that it can have some severe um, effects, as well as the somatosensory, proprioception, tactile, and in order to know where we are in space, we integrate information from all these different senses. Um, so the first thing I think is important to point out is that self-motion perception is vital for all species, humans, animals. We all need to know where we're moving in space in order to interact with the environment. Now, within self-motion perception, a field that really interests me is multisensory calibration and adaptation. And that is, how do we adapt to the environment? How do our senses adapt to the environment? So you can see a couple of examples here. You know, you can see um, if someone goes to space, for example, they suddenly lose their vestibular sense and they need to adapt to where they are. But you don't need to go to space to have to adapt. Uh, simply take a cruise during uh, non-corona times or use any appendage, whether it's a hearing aid or, a, or, or gloves or even just uh, wearing glasses, changes the way one sense interacts with the world. And I would argue that it's not, adaptation is often studied within one sense, but that's not good enough because when, something happens, whether it's loss of function or, or anything like that, the whole system needs to adapt. Um, and of course, this isn't just a function of loss. It's not just an, an issue of loss of function. It's also a normal function. So plasticity, multisensory plasticity is an ongoing capacity that we constantly need to use in order to adapt to the environment. Now, self-motion perception is particularly interesting to study multisensory uh, multi calibration. And that is because if someone loses their vestibular sense, they, suffer, they, they have remarkable functional recovery. And we constantly need to adapt to see space. You know, when you get in a boat, when you get off, you feel different to when you get on, you're constantly adapting. So self-motion is an inherently multisensory uh, sense, perception, and uh, multisensory adaptation is, is uh, um, 
it's a great way to study multi-center adaptation. So the way we study this in the lab is we have two uh, motion simulators, um, one for humans. So you can see over here, we have a, a big, it's a very big, uh, whoever's from the, from the center and wants to come and see it in the lab, you're welcome to. It's a one ton uh, simulator where someone sits on the platform over here. And the whole platform can move in different directions as if the video goes across the zoom, uh, you can see we can move people in different directions together with virtual reality. And if you've if ever sat on the train and experienced that you feel like you yourself are moving because the train next to you is moving, then you've, you've been uh, susceptible to a multi-sensory illusion. And we can induce many of those types of illusions or uh, discrepancies in the lab. So we could move someone in different directions vestibularly by inertial motion, and we can generate self-motion perception via the, vis the visual sense in the same or in a different direction. And we can test multi-sensory integration and multi-sensory calibration like that. And we built here in our lab a multi-sensory rat uh, uh, setup, which is based on robotic arms, industrial robotic arms. And the rat sits in a cage on the one arm, while on the other arm, there's a sphere. So you can see when we use the system, what we do is we move the rat cage into the sphere. And here you can just get a peek into the sphere in order to see what is happening. And the way we generate the stimuli is we move the rat around, just like we move the people around in the human simulator. And the sphere can be static, but we can also move the sphere around and keep the rat static. So that way we can generate multi-sensory stimuli, which can either be inertial, vestibular, in other words, moving the animal around in space, or they can be relative, which is moving the environment relative to the animal. So I mentioned before that humans use visual as a, as a relative cue of motion. So when you move in one direction, it's equivalent to if the world were to move moving in the opposite direction. So, so too with rats, we test that over here where we can move the whole environment there's actually a room like that somewhere in the world, I think in Germany, where you can sit in a chair and the entire room can flip upside down. I've never been there, but it's, it's, quite, a, uh, um, it's quite an experience from what I've been told. Then the rat uh, drinks from a reward port, it has to keep its, its head straight. And at the end of the stimulus needs to choose by drinking from a reward port on the left or the right, whether the self motion was to the left or to the right of straight ahead. And thereby we can have similar behaviors and similar tasks in humans and in rats. So I think that's one of the, the strengths of, of, of what we've got here in the lab, we'd be able to test similar behaviors, which are vital for all species and in different species. So one of the basic experiments that we run is called heading discrimination. And for heading discrimination, what we do is you move a person on the platform forward to the right or forward to the left with slight discrepancies to the right or to the left. And the person needs to indicate whether their motion was to the right or to the left. Now for easy headings to the right, for example, 10 degrees to the right, the person will always choose, almost always choose to the right. It's very easy. So this is what you've got here on the x-axis is the stimuli, where zero means straight ahead, positive values are to the right and negative values are to the left. Um, and on the y-axis, you've got the proportion of rightward choices. So for a 10 degree heading stimulus, it's pretty easy to choose right almost all of the time. So the proportion of right of choices will be one. For minus 10, it's pretty easy to choose left all of the time. So the proportion of right of choices will be zero. And as we approach zero, we start making random guesses because we're actually moving straight ahead. And as we get close to zero, it's harder to discern. So for example, at minus two degrees, one might choose 30% to the right and 70% to the left. So we're still getting correct, but there's statistically correct, not 100% correct. Now we can run the same, we can run the same stimulus, but visually. So we can generate self motion with the visual stimulus, either straight ahead or to the right. And we can build a psychometric function for the visual only stimulus. And once finally, we can put the two together and get the combined stimulus. Now the combined stimulus will be steeper than each of the individual stimuli because of multi-center integration. So there's a, a great body of work that studied how, it should, how much it should get better based on Bayesian statistics. And um, we will discuss that a little bit later on. So the first uh, set of data I'd like to present is self-motion perception in Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's is typically known as a motor disorder. So that means that if you ask any neurologist, they'll tell you that mostly it's categorized as akinesia, bradykinesia, inability or difficulty to walk, rigidity, tremor, 
Now, I think that it's one thing to observe motor deficits. I'm not saying that Parkinson's isn't a motor disease. It is as well, but it's got many other issues as well. And to demonstrate that, let me ask you if you've ever seen, a, if you would guess how you would walk around the room if you were to be blindfolded. So if I were to blindfold you, you might walk around the room like this. So I might say that you have a disorder with your arms because you have to pick them up. But if I understood that the reason why you would walk around the room like that may be perceptual, then that would also affect your motor uh, behavior. So I believe that part of disease that are motor diseases also have perceptual um, um, impairments. And because they're less observable, we need to actually go and measure them directly. So that was the, the rationale to study uh, self motion perception in Parkinson's. Um, and much less is known about perceptual disorders, um, but it can affect basic motor function as well. So um, this first uh, uh, data set was uh, um, done by Sol, who was a master's student in my lab. And she found that visual self motion perception, specifically visual, is impaired in Parkinson's. So look, for example, at these example curves. The Parkinson's is in red and the control is in blue. So you'll see that the Parkinson's is always less steep than the control. So we can run the visual stimulus in different conditions. We can run 100% coherence. That means all the stars are moving coherently in the environment. So that's an easy visual stimulus. Or we could run it where some of the stars are moving randomly. So when some of the stars are moving randomly, in this example here, 65% of the stars are moving coherently, that means the remainder, 35% are moving randomly, that reduces perception. So we can see that everyone's, everyone's performance got worse. We can see worse performance by a psychometric function that becomes less like a step function. The flatter it gets, the worse the performance. So while we can see that everyone gets worse for lower coherence, consistently the PD patient is worse than the control. Yet when we compare their vestibular performance, surprisingly, we found that their vestibular perception was not worse. And we see this across the group as well. So the Parkinson's patients over here, we can measure performance by thresholds, where higher thresholds mean worse performance. The red, the Parkinson's had higher thresholds versus the controls. We had age-matched controls as well as also a young group for comparison, whereas the vestibular performance was unimpaired. And we saw this whether they were on or off medications. So the first result we found is that visual self-motion perception seems impaired in Parkinson's. <clears throat> We then went on to study what happens with their, um, with their integration. But beforehand, um, we also found that the uh, disease correlates with the visual impairment. So the more a person, the further, the further a person is along the disease, the UPDRS measures the disease impairment, the more they are impaired, the higher their thresholds, the worse they are. Whereas for vestibular, there's no correlation, just as we found no uh, impairment in the disease. Um, the next thing we asked was, what about multi-center integration? So this theory, Bayesian theory, that postulates that we should integrate our senses based on the reliability of the cues, which means that we rely on a more reliable cue more than we would rely on a less reliable cue. And there are quantitative predictions as to how much we should rely on each cue. So we could study this based on the predicted weights, how much we predict each person relies on their cue versus the observed weights of the visual cues. And we found that Parkinson's patients, so we expect the data to lie along the diagonal. We expect the observed to be similar to the predicted. And we found that on average, the Parkinson's are further from the diagonal than the controls, meaning that they, in, they, they overweight their visual cues. They seem to rely more on their visual cues. So the finding is two, twofold. Firstly, their visual cues seem more impaired than normal individuals. And despite the impairment, they seem to rely on them uh, more. And this is just the difference between observed and the predicted. So that led us into a second study, uh, which was run by Orly, who was just finishing her master's in uh, my lab. Um, and uh, it's in the stages of, of submitting this work for publication. And the, what we wanted to study here was basic visual function in Parkinson's of motion. So is the self-motion perception impairment in Parkinson's does it result from specifically understanding where I am moving in space, or is there just a basic visual motion deficit in Parkinson's? Surprisingly, this hasn't been much studied in Parkinson's. Um, although, you know, probably many of you know the random dot kinematogram, um, Shadlin and Newsom that have studied it in monkeys and it's been used um, in many, many different studies. Surprisingly, hasn't been really applied apart from one or two minor studies that tested in Parkinson's. So we set out to test 
is just basic visual motion perception impaired in Parkinson's. And secondly, we wanted to get into this question of multisensory integration and study why Parkinson's seem to overweight their visual cues. So we hypothesized that perhaps they overweight their visual cues because they overestimate the reliability of the visual cues. So in this study, we tested random dot kinematograms. These are dots on a screen, and the, the participant needs to um, experience a, a visual stimulus of so the dots moving. Most of the dots are moving either to the right or to the left. Once again, we can play with the coherence and participants need to report whether the dots are moving to the right or to the left. And we found in terms of basic thresholds, we found that the Parkinson's would, did not differ from, from the uh, age mesh group or the young group. In fact, marginally, not significantly, if anything, they were better. So the deficit of, of visual self motion seems to be integrating the visual cues to understand where I'm moving in space and not just the basic visual motion deficit. Then we, as I said, we set out to test confidence. Do they over underestimate their confidence? Specifically, we hypothesize they might overestimate their visual cues. And if they overestimate the visual cues then they might weight them more when integrating them. So we just addressed the first question of do they overweight their cues? And for this, we we devised a plot, which is a confidence plot, in addition to the psychometric plot. So on the top row, you see the psychometric plot. You see the proportion of rightward choices as a function of coherence. In this case, this isn't the self-motion, this is not coherence. So for coherence of 100, 100%, it's easy to tell the dots are moving to the right. Minus 100% coherence just means all the dots are moving to the left. And we can see a psychometric function um, for the controls and for the Parkinson's disease. And then what we also did was after each choice of right or left, the participant reported their confidence in their decision. So if they were confident they made a correct choice, they reported high confidence. If they were not confident that they made a, high, a correct choice, they reported low confidence. And the second row, you see the confidence plots. So here we plot the high confidence as a function of coherence. So you can see, and we, we, we pulled everything towards rightward, head, rightward directions. So 100% coherence means that the dots were moving either all to the right or all to the left. And that, and that shows always that they were very confident. So that's the high values over here. Now look what happens with the, with the uh, control participant. As the coherence gets more difficult, meaning it approaches zero, um, the participant starts to report low confidence values and drops to very low confidence. And these are the incorrect choices. So this is a minus 25% coherence, meaning it's the dots were moving to the left, but the participant nonetheless chose to the right. So they made a wrong choice and they were not confident in the choice and therefore their confidence is low here. The Parkinson's does drop, but it doesn't drop as much. We quantified this by the point at which the curve crosses the 0% coherence. So we said where they cross 0% coherence, that's the ambiguous stimulus, we quantify this as the confidence bias. And when we compared the confidence bias across Parkinson's versus the, um, the control groups, we found that the Parkinson's patients were significantly overconfident in their choices. So this bared fruit to show that our hypothesis that they are overconfident in their choices, at least in this task, holds true. So if I were to summarize the Parkinson's data that we have so far, <clears throat> we show that they have impaired visual self-motion perception, unimpaired vestibular self-motion perception, and it seems the visual impairment seems specific to self-motion. It's not a general visual motion perception impairment, but it's integrating the visual cues to understand where I am moving in space. This also led to a multi-center integration deficit, specifically um, overweighting of visual cues, which may be explained by overconfidence in visual perception. Um, okay, that's the Parkinson's uh, data. Adam, can we ask a question? Is this a of course. Question? Go for it. Okay, so um, I was wondering what you think the relationship would be between such confidence ratings and uh, the over ratings at the Bayesian level. I mean, do one really reflect the other? One I, I said probably is probably an implicit process, the other one is explicit. What do you think? What's your hypothesis on the relation between the two? So we, we haven't addressed this yet. This is, this is a logical next step. Um, the Bayesian, as you mentioned, measures the implicit biases and the implicit weights. Um, but I think that those weights need to come from some sort of estimates of the Q reliability. So if the, if the individual's estimates are incorrect, then they will weight their Qs incorrectly. So all we've shown now is that their, their, their reported estimates are incorrect. 
And we've also shown that they have overweighting. I think putting the two together is a logical conclusion, but that's a piece of the puzzle that still needs to be done in the future. Adam. Yes. Adam, I had a related question also, which was whether the overconfidence is specific to visual stimuli or to the kind of tasks that you have been using, or is this a phenomenon known for Parkinson's disease patients? So that's a very interesting question. So one of the parallel studies that we're running in the lab now, which, which we haven't completed, unfortunately, the corona stopped that study because we, had, we, we could not bring participants anymore into the lab very easily. But I'm testing this in the, in the motion platform. We have visual and vestibular stimuli, and that would give me the option, to, the, the handle to see, is this a general overconfidence or is it specific to vision? Based on the multi-center integration weighting bias and changes, I think it may be specific to visual, but it may be for other cues as well. So I think maybe the somatosensory vestibular might be regular and visual might be different, but, but that's an open question. Uh, I also want to ask a question. Um, first, it is also very important, like uh, the statistics of uh, the vision imperity, because if it is just noisy, maybe in the brain they can still kind of uh, do uh, averaging and reduce the noise, especially with with uh, with, uh, with uh, high quality integration. So maybe still, even if it is uh, impaired, it can be more valuable uh, in a sensory integration. Second, I didn't understand so much. I mean, for me, I think that maybe the the more um, uh, reliable, uh, re uh, relying more on, on uh, the vision is maybe a kind of compensation because uh, they rely less on other like uh, cues or other senses. So this is also something that I didn't get exactly from. So, li so let me answer the second question first. So um, we, when we test multi integration, we measure the actual cue reliability. So we measured their vestibular cue reliability and it was just as good as, as, as other controls. The visual cue reliability was impaired. So if it's a compensation, then the Bayesian would actually predict that you should compensate and wait. And, and actually normal people, we can test this. We can play with your visual perception simply by changing the coherence. So if I, for example, test a normal person in the system and I give them 100% visual uh, coherence, they will rely more on the visual cue. As we reduce the visual coherence, they begin to rely more and more on the vestibular cue. And this is done implicitly and immediately. So we can interleave trials and flip them around and you do it automatically. And you do it in, in many different examples as has been shown. For example, uh, um, the McGurk effect, where you rely on the visual cue when you see the mouth moving, but you rely on the auditory cue when you don't see the mouth moving. So we do this on the fly and we are constantly and immediately estimating the reliability of the cues. So Parkinson's, if at all, they've experienced this deterioration over time, they should, the Bayesian integration mechanism should detect that the visual cue reliability is less and weighted less. And this isn't the case. So, um, so the compensation here is wrong. The compensation is relying on something that is no longer accurate, is no longer reliable. Um, and back to the first question. So yes, basically that's how we test it in the lab. We, we play with the coherence and we can therefore manipulate the reliability. That's in the motion platform. And in the random dot kinematogram, the, the coherence is actually the parameter that we measure. So, so the, coherence, the coherence is the one that's on the X axis, that's on the plot. So, People are integrating. The fact that they can perform and we can get a, a, a psychometric function means that they are integrating despite the noise. Um, and that's our measure of performance, how they're performing despite the noise. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now to uh, a different study, uh, one of cross-century adaptation. And this is work that is done by a PhD students in my lab, Shear. And in this experiment, we wanted to study how we adapt how our senses adapt to one another, cross-sensory adaptation. So the way we did this was we tested this in the motion platform where we gave several stimuli in one sense, for example, the vestibular sense, and then we gave a test stimulus in the visual sense and we flipped them around. And those, the prior stimuli could be biased. So they could be biased either to the left or to the right. So we'd, for example, give three um, vestibular stimuli biased to the left, that's what you see in blue. And there would be they were distributed. So it's a, random, it's a random normal distribution, but just a little bit to the left. And then the visual stimulus that we gave is unbiased. And we tested performance on the visual. 
And we did this biasing to the left and biasing to the right or interleaved. So trials would either be biased to the right or to the left counterbalanced. And we tested visual biases and testing the testing cross tensory, so all the different conditions. So we biased the visual, tested the visual, biased the vestibular, tested the vestibular, and then cross tensory as well. Biased the visual, tested the vestibular, or biased the vestibular and tested the visual. And um, then we tested how each sense adapts to the, to, to the stimuli of the previous sense. And the first thing we, we found is that there is cross sensory adaptation. So we'll first show this for unisensory. And the way we tested this was we plotted the psychometric function of the test stimuli, of the responses to the test stimuli, partitioned, divided by whether the prior stimuli were biased or unbiased, or biased to the left or biased to the right. So what you see here are two psychometric functions in light blue and in dark blue, where the stimuli are identical for both of the, for all of the data for these functions. So the x-axis is identical. They're all the heading stimuli to the right or to the left. The only difference between these two, and this is one participant, the only difference between these two is whether the prior stimuli were biased to the left or to the right. So if the prior stimuli were biased to the left, we see that the Q, that we basically see that the psychometric functions shift apart. And that is the adaptation effect. And this we label as vez vez, meaning that the, this, the biasing cue was vestibular and the test cue was vestibular. We find the same thing if it's visual to vestibular. So if the biasing cue was vestibular, we still see the same effect. We still see this cross sensory adaptation. So experiencing this visual stimuli that are biased in one direction led to a cross sensory bias, even in the other sense. And um, we see this both unisensory and cross sensory. And if we were to summarize, unisensory, we see, so we, we calculated by the difference between the psychometric function, the PSE shift. And we see that both vestibular to vestibular and visual to visual, so these are the unisensory conditions, lead to significant uh, cross sensory adaptation, as well as, sorry, significant unisensory adaptation, adaptation within the sense. And also cross sensory adaptation in both directions, we get significant cross sensory adaptation. So um, basically what we're showing here, I mean, if I, if I really jump to, to a little bit of discussion, this is showing me that adaptation goes beyond a sense, that, it, that in order to adapt cross sensory, it means I need to be experiencing the, 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 the multi-sensory or the, the overall effects of, this, of, of my perception and adapting that, across tensors. So that's why it's interesting to me. Now we wanted to get in and to find out what exactly it is that's being adapted. So we see that there's this shift, but is the shift happening, is this calibration of adaptation happening because of the previous stimuli? So it's like just a regular sensory adaptation. Is it happening because, you know, there's this concept called serial dependence where people often repeat prior choices. So this is going to do with the previous choices. And in order to do so, we fit the data to a model where in the model we input the current stimulus, so that should have the strongest effect, the previous stimulus, the previous choice, as well as the baseline. I'm not going to get into the model details uh, due to lack of time, but the bottom line is just to differentiate what parameter is, is leading to this cross-sensory adaptation. So the model, the model fit results showed firstly a strong effect the, the, the strongest parameter was the current stimulus. So I make my choices based on the current stimulus. It's good to know that I'm not just basing my choices on the past, but I'm basing my choices on the current stimulus. And we found that the previous stimulus led to significant adaptation. So the negative values here mean that if I experienced a previous stimulus to the left, and then I experienced a, an ambiguous stimulus, for example, straight ahead, that I will tend to perceive that stimulus as being to the right. So this is a type of a classical adaptation that you might know like the waterfall effect, where if you look at a waterfall where all the water is falling and then you look at a tree, you'll tend to perceive the tree as moving up. That's an adaptive effect. So here we see cross sensory adaptation where experiencing the stimulus, experiencing one sensory stimulus in a particular direction biases our subsequent perception of even a different sense, but it's measuring the same um, feature like my self motion, leads to cross sensory adaptation. The previous choice in this experiment uh, did not have a significant effect. Um, so our conclusion in these data is that we have cross sensory adaptation. Um, that's a sensory adaptation, just like the waterfall effect, but it goes across sensors. 
Um, so if I were to summarize, we see cross-image adaptation of visual and vestibular cues, even for short duration stimuli. That's important to, show, important to say because there are one or two studies that have shown that you need long adaptation in order to adapt cross-sensory. So we show even for short duration stimuli. Um, and I'm not going to get into possible differences with previous studies that uh, um, I'm going to run through in order to get to some more data. Any questions on the cross-image adaptation before I move on to presenting some autism data? <clears throat> All right. So um, another uh, uh, third leg of, uh, of, of research in the lab relates to autism. And here we studied uh, priors. In other words, once again, how we use previous information in order to interpret subsequent information. And the motivation to study this is that autism is maybe well known for its social and uh, social uh, um, symptoms, mainly communication, interaction, but it also has non-social symptoms. And some of them are well described in the DSM, but some of them are not well described. For example, perceptual differences. There's talk about enhanced local, perhaps impaired global integration, but these are not part of the current diagnostic criterion and they're not well, not, we don't really have a good enough handle as to what is happening with these in autism. So I wanted to study these and to, and to try and understand a little bit more what's happening perceptually. Further, the motivation over here is that a lot of these um, theories try to frame perception in autism from the low level versus high level perception. They try to frame it within, the, to say that people with autism tend to focus on the parts rather than the whole. Um, so there are some theories and these theories led to predictions that there would be an imbalance between priors, top down and bottom up center information. Specifically, the hypotheses, these hypotheses propose that people with autism use prior information to a greater degree, sorry, to a lesser degree than uh, um, other, other people. Basically, they rely more on the sensory input, on the bottom up, on the path. That was the hypothesis. And we were asking, are priors different in autism? So the way we address this is a, a, a study that was recently developed uh, in our lab by uh, Helen and uh, um, also Shiro Bao. And um, the paradigm there is similar to the cross-sensory adaptation paradigm that I explained before, but it's a much simpler and faster paradigm where there's a dot on the screen and participants need to choose whether the dot is to the right or to the left or straight ahead. And once again, we give a bunch of bias stimuli and then a test stimulus to see how the prior stimuli bias the subsequent stimuli. And if the prior stimuli binds the subsequent stimuli, then the test trials will separate based on the prior stimuli. So we applied this paradigm to study this in autism. This is uh, work that Helen did. And we also took prior data from uh, a previous study of mine. Um, and we tried to, from a motion platform with autism, and we tried to see whether we could see the same effect in uh, both cohorts. So these are two different cohorts, um, different paradigms and we tested the effects of prior information. Um, so in autism, what we found is that they have a very strong effect. Actually, contrary to the hypothesis of the reduced effects of priors, we found that people with autism have a strong priors effect. We can see by a good separation between the psychometric curves based on the prior trials, even greater than the controls. And we see the same thing in the other, the heading discrimination paradigm. So we see the same results, basically that they actually use the prior trials to a greater degree than uh, regular individuals. And if we calculate the difference in the PSC for autism versus controls, in both of these different cohorts, we see a significant difference, meaning individuals with autism seem to be more affected by the prior trials. Now, just as I explained before, we wanted to get in to understand what is the basis of this difference. Is it the prior stimuli, is it the prior trials? What is leading to this? So we used the same model. And we fit the data to uh, the model. And we found that the basic uh, response to the stimulus was similar across the two. So autism is in red and controls are in blue. We found that both individuals largely make the choices based on where the dot is actually on the screen. Um, the previous stimulus led to some sort of adaptation similar to the, the, uh, the, the um, motion platform experiment you showed before. But, and, but there's no difference in participants. What we did find here is that um, there was a strong influence of prior choices. And the influence of prior choices was in the positive direction, meaning that individuals largely tended to repeat their previous choices. 
So firstly, the diff there's a significant difference between the, the autism and the controls. You can see in both cohorts, we found that individuals with autism, this was their difference, that they had a stronger um, tendency to repeat their previous choice. So it's kind of a confirmation consistency bias, which everyone seems to have, but it's increased in autism. So firstly, this is, we didn't see this in the, in the, in the previous uh, cross tensor adaptation uh, experiment from Shear. And a big difference between these trials is that the motion platform has to move for one second forward, the person has to make a choice, and then it returns to, there's a, a good few seconds between trials, and there's possibly less influence of the previous choices. Whereas this experiment runs really quickly between the stimuli. You have a dot, make a choice, another dot, choose the right or the left, another dot, choose the right or the left. So it seems that the speed of the stimulus seems to elicit um, a larger confirmation bias in everyone. And this, as I say, was larger in the, um, in the autism group than in the control group. So um, this uh, also is currently uh, um, under review. So to summarize the autism results, we find that individuals with autism show a larger short-term effect of priors, and it's an effect of prior choices, not an effect of the prior stimuli. So this seems to be a larger consistency bias in perceptual decisions. So by this, we, we think we're showing that, um, that autism, besides the, the, the communication and social deficits or differences, um, perception also seems to be different. Specifically, um, it might show similar, a similar response to the repetitive and restrictive symptoms of, of repeating prior choices. Um, Okay, and once again, this is replicated in two different tasks and in two different groups. In fact, one cohort is from Israel and one cohort is from the USA. Um, and then I'll jump to the last part of my talk, which is about multisensory behavior in rats. But just before that, if there are any questions in the autism results. Yeah, there might have a question. So I'm wondering, uh, how can you decide here if their uh, tendency to press the same button again is just a repetitive behavior? or it's a perceptual effect of repetitive behavior? I mean, isn't this just a tendency to press the same button in a row a couple of times? Okay, so that's a good question. So in the, uh, in, in the data that I didn't show, we ran a bunch of, uh, a bunch of experiments on controls where we, we had all different types of, uh, of uh, controls where they would report the prior choice with one button press and report the, uh, um, the test stimulus with a different button press, for example. And in controls, we show that these are, are, are uh, um, different. Namely, there's still the, the, the prior choice carries over whether or not you use the same action to report it or not. It also carries over even if you withhold the, the, the report. So it's not just a motor repetitiveness. And also in the autism, we ran a, a bunch of other controls. So long story short, uh, there is an effect. Um, it's not just a motor repetitive effect. Um, and also, if it was just a motor repetitive effect, you would also see it with the, uh, with the easy stimuli. And yet with the easy stimuli, they're, they're still performing the task correctly. In other words, it's still largely based on the stimulus. So they're still making a decision. Um, all right, any other questions before I move on? All right, so um, lastly, I'd like to present uh, rat uh, results from the lab. And uh, this is work that was started by a master's student in my lab, Lior, and this is also work that is uh, currently being written up. And th the goal here was firstly to create a paradigm in rats to test self-motion perception. So there, is, there was no multi-sensory self-motion perception paradigm that can move rats in different directions and give vestibular as well as relative motion stimuli, test their behavior and record neuronally all at the same time. So that was the uh, audacious goal of this project. Um, I'm presenting here the behavior results, which show proof of concept. They show first with, with the proof of the behavior. Namely, we tested inertial perception. We tested relative motion perception. We investigated what these cues are, and um, we tested the multi-sensory integration. So in blue, you see the responses of individual rats. These are eight individual rats. In blue, you can see their psychometric function responses to the inertial motion stimuli. In red, you can see their responses to the relative motion stimuli. That means the sphere moving while the rat is stationary. And in green, you can see the multisensory responses. So a few things to point out here. Firstly, to our surprise, the relative motion stimuli were more reliable than the inertial motion stimuli. We thought that the rats would be very good vestibularly and very poor with the relative motion, basically because we thought relative motion is largely visual and rodents are not known for their uh, 
exceptional visual uh, acu uh, um, acuity. So we thought we'd find better inertial, namely vestibular responses versus visual. What we also see here is that the combined cues in green are more reliable than the individual cues. So we can already see visually here, multi-center integration in these reds. So let's get into the, the data. Um, firstly, um, our first control was to see what, um, is, was to make sure that the relative motion cue was in fact a relative motion cue, and that the rats weren't, for example, listening to the robots and deciding which direction the robots were moving and making a choice based on that. So the first thing we did was we removed the sphere and we ran all the experiments in the same way, but without a sphere. So the, the, the big robot moving the sphere was doing all the same movements, but the sphere no longer moved around the rat. And what we saw is that this completely annihilated the relative motion stimulus. So you need this, the rat needs the sphere to be moving in order to perceive relative motion. The other thing which proves um, that this relative motion cue works is that look, look what happened to the blue, look what happened to the inertial motion cue. So the way we typically run the inertial motion cue is that both robots will move at the same time. So the relative motion remains static and the inertial motion, mainly, meaning the vestibular motion um, happens. So the vestibular is over here in blue and you can see when we remove the sphere, the same stimulus, meaning the same robot moving, the same robots in motion, suddenly the, the inertial became multisensory. Why? Because the rats were now open to the environment. So the multisensory cue became, sorry, the inertial cue became a multisensory cue. The relative motion cue was totally annihilated, meaning that the rats needed the, the, um, the, the sphere to be moving around it. So this proves that the inertial motion cue is really just an inertial motion cue, that the relative motion cue is a relative motion cue and not based on the sound of the robot. Um, so it's not noise from the robots and without a sphere, the, rats, the, the inertia becomes a uh, combined. Now, our basic, um, you could say, uh, axiom over here was that the relative motion cue was visual. So we set out to prove this. And the way, we, the way we generate the visual cue is that inside the sphere, we have a strip of lead lights and a bunch of lead lights can turn on randomly. The motion is generated and the lights turn off. And therefore we generate the visual motion cue, which is generated through actual motion of the lead lights through space. So part of this was to, there's a lot of um, uh, confounds associated with people who do virtual reality in rodents, where they put a rodent in a virtual reality system, have the animal run on a ball, and generate visual motion stimuli, which are just generated by a projector. We wanted to avoid that and have the actual lead lights move. Uh, so it's kind of a low-tech robotic way. And um, during the experiments, this uh, sphere over here that you can see is closed. So the rats are in the dark and then when the lights go on, that's all they have. So we proved this. We thought we would at least, and we found something very surprising that even without the lead lights on, the rats were able to perform just as well. So at first we uh, thought this was very strange. We didn't understand these results because we assumed that the rats would be using the light. And we, we cracked our heads on this for a bit. And we found that the thresholds on average across rats were not worse with the lights off versus the lights on, not significantly worse. So this told us that the rats weren't using the visual cue in order to perform this task. So what were they using? Um, so we eventually found that the rats were sensing the airflow within the, within the sphere. So over here, what you see is a plot of the airflow within the sphere. So when we give an inertial motion stimulus in blue, everything is moving together. And just like when you're in your car and you're driving, the air moves together with you. So we move the rats together with their sphere, which is their little car. The environment was static and all they had was, was inertial motion stimulus. When, however, we kept the sphere static and we moved the rat, so this is a multi-sensory cue, because the rat's getting the relative motion cue, as well as the inertial motion cue, and we measured the airflow, you can see that in, um, in green, that's the combined cue. So we measure airflow, meaning that the sphere stays static, the rat moves within the sphere, and the rat experiences airflow. Also, when we move the sphere and keep the rat static, so it's the same relative cue. Once again, we, we, we generate, because the, the, the sphere moves, the air moves with the sphere and the rat stays static, and this generates the same relative airflow motion cue in rats. So this really gave us a feeling that maybe the rats are sensing airflow in order to perceive their relative self motion. It seemed like a little bit of a, a long shot, um, but we took a fan, a computer fan, and we placed it in the sphere during the stimulus, just 
to blow air in different directions. And we found that the air, so the baseline is in, is in, uh, in gray before, without the fan on. With the fan on, we have uh, in color, the inertial motion perception was not impaired at all. So whether it's inertial perception with the fan on or off, there was no difference. When the fan was on, the relative self motion was uh, deteriorated. Um, being extra careful, we ran the same experiment, but we covered the fan so that the noise of the fan would remain, but the airflow would not be disturbed anymore, and the relative motion cue jumped back to normal. A third angle, we placed a windshield, like a little uh, uh, windshield in front of the rat during the inertial motion stimuli, and the windshield decreased again the relative motion perception, but not the inertial motion perception. So we feel fairly confident now that rats use airflow in order to detect self motion. So we set out to test visual and vestibular integration of self-motion perception in rats. And we landed up testing vestibular and airflow integration in rats. But fortunately for us, all the Bayesian uh, predictions remain the same. Um, I think the, 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 the most interesting finding is the fact that they use airflow and that's, as I said, kind of been written up. But if we look also at what happens in the Bayesian multi-sense integration sphere, we see that in all the different conditions, um, in the conditions that we didn't disturb airflow, which are these three first conditions, the relative motion cue had relative, had better thresholds, threshold, good thresholds are low, and the combined cue thresholds were lower and um, better on average. When we impaired the airflow, the relative self motion cues jumped up. So when we had the windshield or the fan, the relative motion perception decreased, while the inertial Vestibular motion perception thresholds remained the same, and the combined Q thresholds went up and were um, went according to the Bayesian predictions, being meaning slightly better than the best Q. So if we look at the predicted, if we look at the observed thresholds versus the predicted thresholds of the combined Q, we see that these lie pretty much along the diagonal, meaning that as the um, as the uh, as the one Q gets worse, then the combined Q also gets worse according to the Bayesian predictions. And the sensory weights also show that as we play with the sensory weights of the relative motion cue, the rats adapt. It's not entirely Bayesian, so they're not optimal, but then again, not neither are humans and neither are monkeys. So we're what you call near Bayesian optimal, and also the rats are near Bayesian optimal. So rats seem to integrate the stimular and visual cues for self-motion perception. The last thing that we found was we, our, our natural suspect was the whiskers would be used for self-motion, to, to sense this airflow cue. When we trimmed the whiskers, surprisingly, we found that they were still able to perceive this. So they seem to be detecting the airflow cues on their fur of their whole body, or perhaps an integration of their whole body. And they, 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 the whiskers seem to be more are known to be a more active sensing uh, cue. They're not, they're not the ones that are sensing the airflow for self-motion perception. Um, I'm gonna skip the uh, serial dependent results for the rats and uh, jump to the summary that rats use airflow to detect relative self-motion perception. Um, they possibly integrate this based on information for the whole body as a matter of sensory uh, integration. And um, this may explain how rodents can run so fast in the dark. I know that Rafi's mentioned this before and other people who work with rats see that they can run and they can navigate. And there is other work that shows that rats use wind in order to navigate. So they seem to actually navigate based on airflow cues. Um, the optic stimuli uh, seem to be weaker than airflow, so there's no major improvement when we added the, uh, the lead lights in the sphere. And rats seem to integrate in a Bayesian uh, near optimal manner. And now we're recording the neural basis for this uh, uh, multi-sensory integration from um, multi-sensory areas like the posterior parietal cortex, the frontal orienting fields, uh, perhaps also somatosensory areas and also the basal ganglia. And uh, this is work in progress. So um, I'd like to end by saying thank you to all the people who contributed to uh, this work. A um, bunch of students here listed on the left. Um, collaborators, I'm only I mentioning those collaborators, but many collaborators, as Rui mentioned, including in, himself, I'm mentioning the collaborators that are were specific to the work that was presented in this presentation, as well as the funding agencies. And if anyone has any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Adam, for a great talk. Um, questions can be, I think, uh, done uh, verbally and orally. I didn't look at the chat, so if anyone sent any questions in the chat, just ask them verbally. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so if, uh, I'll start in that case. So I was wondering, um, especially for the uh, very interesting finding that we actually use airflow. So I guess this is also probably true for humans, right? So I feel kind of, so what happens? Why do I not get a sensation of moving forward when there's a gust of wind? Okay. Okay, so, so that's, a, that's a really good question. I, I'm also guessing that humans use airflow. And in fact, when I presented the result, results recently at a conference, um, um, I met a friend there from America who's, who's been studying self-motion perception for years. And he said that a long time ago, he learned that when they have certain experiments that have big forward motions, they had to put a mask on people in order to prevent them from having, from using those cues. So, so anecdotally, there's never been, never been actually proven, but anecdotally, humans do use airflow uh, perception. And, um, and uh, a lot of the experiments that were done with humans in the motion platform actually use a face mask. Um, not necessarily to prevent that, but more to hold the head in space, but um, it seems that humans do use it. And um, so there's one thing, so the first thing is I think we do, we do use it. Um, now, there's an interesting problem that arises that if we do use it, we need to dissociate what is my self motion and what is the wind. And that's not a new problem. I mean, we do that all the time visually. When I'm moving in space, I have my self-generated self, uh, um, motion of optic flow, but there's also objects moving in the environment or even a train moving in the environment that, that may tell me that I'm moving. And the brain has to learn to dissociate what relates to me and what, what relates to the environment. So there could be many mechanisms here in the brain to generate what is expected. In other words, if I'm moving and, I, and, I gener and, I, and I'm in a, in, a, in a building, for example, where there's no wind, I may be a lot more sensitive to the airflow movement. Um, also, if I'm generating m motion, then, then I will be more sensitive to it. Or if I feel a constant wind gust, then I might just learn to, to subtract that from what I'm doing. It probably is more difficult for airflow perception than it is for visual, but um, the mechanisms are there and they exist. It's a matter of quantitatively, which is more and which is less. And anecdotally, after I studied, after I found this in rats, I said, well, you know, we have to test this also in humans. I haven't got there yet because it's very complex to uh, generate airflow stimuli for humans. But I did anecdotally close my eyes and walk around a little bit. And if you notice it, we're actually, we feel it, we're pretty sensitive. I could definitely feel an extra sense of, um, of, uh, of, of, the, of the environment. So it would be something that would be interesting to study. Um, and I have no doubt that humans use it as well. Uh, the question is to what extent and how we handle environmental factors. Those are good and open questions. I think this is a field that really, um, uh, we're just touching on it, opening up a whole new, uh, uh, whole new Pandora's box of, uh, of interesting questions. So just anecdotally to add to that, I wanted to tell you that uh, now when we want to simulate a motion in virtual reality, many people are using fans to uh, kind of get the feeling that you're moving forward. Uh, when you're actually kind of walking in place on a motion platform. Cool. Any other questions? Yes, um, I guess I'll ask, uh, I was wondering about the autism research um, when you say that uh, um, the ones who have autism tend to press this, this same response more than once um, or follow the same response that they did in a prior trial. Is this about, or do we know if this is about inhibition, lack of inhibition? Is it, sh should we think about this same as we think about perseverations of all kinds? I haven't, so I actually haven't got into what the mechanisms may be, um, whether it's a lack of inhibition or perseveration but I think it's important to point out that this is, a, this is a nuanced difference. So if, for example, the stimulus appears at one degree to the right, where you would judge it to be 80% to the right and 20% to the left, also the people with autism are judging it to be maybe 85% 80 to the right or, or uh, on average, 80% 80, 80 to the right and 20% to the left, they're just more influenced by the slightly previous trial. So they're by the immediately preceding trial. So they are making the choice and they're making a fine choice here. So the differences are, are nuanced. They're making the choices, not like they cannot perform the, the, the stimulus correctly. They cannot perform the task correctly. They're performing a very, very fine discrimination. And this is just a simple bias. So if for me, the 80% might move up to 82% if I've made the previous right or choices and down to 78% if I've made a previously left or choice, for them it might jump from 80 to 90 or down to 70. So the effect is stronger, but 
the main effects are still a fine discrimination. So I don't think it's a, a lack of inhibition because if it were a lack of inhibition, then, then they would have difficulty performing the task in the first place. And, and their thresholds are just as good, sometimes even better. So I think it's more a matter of a response to doubt. In all of these questions, we, in all of these stimuli, they're all stimuli where we have doubts as to whether we're correct or incorrect. And we make our best guess. I think that they seem to be relying more on, so, so if I'd previously chosen that a similar stimulus was to the right, then I should, be, I should also make that choice now. So there's some sort of consistency that pulls through. That's my hunch. But as I say, I haven't really got much handle on to the exact mechanisms as to what this difference is. Okay, any final question? Okay then, so let's thank uh, Adam. So he gave a great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we will meet here at the same time next week for our next speaker. Have a good week, everyone. Keep safe. Bye.